Now this week we're looking at pedagogy, the various ways you go about teaching. Now there's a lot of theory to do with different pedagogical approaches and I provided you with an overview of that theory and a few papers that you can delve into and explore the theory in more detail. So essentially there are three main pedagogical approaches, um, behaviorism, constructivism and cognitivism. And they each have various advantages and disadvantages. And in general, we don't just use a single pedagogy. We use a combination. We can think of it more of a toolkit where for the particular problem that we have to solve or approach to teaching or different group of students or whatever we have, we draw upon your toolkit of pedagogical approaches. And the better you are as a teacher, the wider variety of different pedagogical approaches you have that you can draw upon, depending upon the situation that you're in, what you're teaching, the, the students that you're teaching it to, and a whole range of other circumstances that are important in deciding which different approach to teaching you will take at any particular time. So explore those various approaches. Now in technologies education, we have two overarching techniques that we utilize. One is direct instruction, which is the traditional um, lesson. The stereotypical teacher at the front delivering a lesson plan and students working that through and so forth. And there are a range of different approaches around doing that. But we're also going to be exploring some other pedagogical approaches, primarily project-based learning, which is an inquiry-based approach that is also used uh, very heavily in technologies education. So to start off with, consider those three different pedagogical theories, behaviorism, cognitivism, and constructivism, and get an understanding of those fundamentals. From that, we're going to be able to explore various approaches to teaching, the first being direct instruction. Now, there are many different formats for direct instruction. Um, lesson planning is certainly a mechanism we utilize to support direct instruction, but direct instruction doesn't have to be just by the teacher. A guided online tutorial, such as the ones you are going to be engaging with where you learn a programming language, is direct instruction, where the computer is taking on the instructional role. What makes it direct instruction is very much it's teacher focused. There's very little student choice involved in what's occurring. Um, the focus is on cognitive development around certain concepts and skills that is very structured. And it's fundamentally independent of the students. It doesn't take a, a lot into account the different needs and strengths and weaknesses of students. It can, but in the main, it tends to be pre-planned and delivered. Um, as you will do very often in your um, practicums, you will pre-plan your lesson plans and you will come in and you will deliver your lesson plan, often without even knowing who your students are going to be, and certainly without knowing them in detail and in depth that a full-time teacher would have with their students. So there are a couple of techniques, though, that can be used to strengthen direct instruction. One approach I've provided you with is the essential learning design model. Now, again, there are various models for direct instruction. This is just one of them. So it starts off with what's called a learning hook, um, sometimes called an anticipatory set in other models, which engages students with thinking about what they're about to learn. So it might be a little activity or quiz or video clip or cartoon, but it just starts stimulating their interest in what they're about to learn. Then we have a learning map, is where we contextualize what they're about to learn with their previous learning on the topic or what might be coming next, but we set it in place. Now, for some students, this is irrelevant, but for others, it's very important. They are what's called global thinkers. They need to see what their learning is in context with an overall learning journey. Then we have the learning outcomes, which is generally a statement of what students are going to be able to do at the end of their learning. So we set in place and let the students know, okay, we're gonna be learning this, and at the end of this, we're going to know how to be able to do this. 
And there are various ways you can set that out. And I've given you a couple of examples of um, setting it out on paper. But in the main, in primary school, we just sort of let students know what they're learning. Then you have what's called the learning input, where you provide some knowledge or processes or techniques that you explain to your students. And this can often involve um, a guided walkthrough. We'll talk about different techniques in a moment, but essentially you're providing something new. So it's something that the students haven't encountered before. Then there's a process of what's called learning construction. Um, so where we build upon their existing knowledge. So it's very, very rare that we introduce something completely new to a student. So it's going to be taught in relation to something that they ex already know. How does this expand upon what they could already do? Um, if we're learning subtraction, we'll talk about how it relates to addition and how it's something slightly different using some different techniques, but builds upon their understanding of addition. So that's learning construction, and that fits in with what we call the constructivist um, learning theory. Then generally there'll be a learning demo where you'll show them how to do something. Now you've probably been exposed to the, um, uh, the little mimeotics, um, we do, I do, you do, or something like that. Um, that's a sort of a simplification of the demonstration process where you demonstrate to students um, what the learning entails. Now, it might be how they apply or understand the knowledge that they're given or a process that they have to do, such as making an object move across their screen if they press different keys on the keyboard in a computer game. Various different ways of demonstrating what they're learning. And then finally, there's a reflection process where students reflect on what they've done and how it contributes to their understanding. So they need to know that they've learnt something new and you need to explicitly state that for them. So this is what you have learnt. So that's one process in direct instruction. It's quite um, strictly regimented and there's various stages and things that need to be go, th go through. Of course, as a teacher, you can ignore certain um, aspects and change things around and do whatever you want. You are the pedagogical experts in your classroom. But fundamentally, it follows that basic structure. And all teachers need to learn how to um, give a direct instruction lesson. It's sort of a fundamental bread and butter. And much of your pre-service practicum experiences will be based upon you doing that. It's a simple way of demonstrating your basic capability as a teacher. So there's a few other things though to think about. One is it, it is very dependent upon a concept called cognitive load, where if we provide too much information to students, then it can overwhelm what's known as their working memory. There's only so much capacity we have in our working memory in order to be able to process new ideas and concepts and, and do things. And if we try to do too much and too many different ideas at once, then we will overload that working memory and it will make it much harder for students to learn. Now, there are various other concepts around um, cognition, which is where this aspect comes from, cognitive science. Um, around memory formation and taking short-term memory and embedding it into long-term memory. But cognitive load theory is just something I want you to think about and something that you'll be um, looking at incorporating into your lesson planning and the processes you go about um, designing the learning activities for technologies education. So some readings there to have a look at that and some strategies that you can utilize to minimize um, cognitive load and to maximize students' potential for learning. So then there are a range of specific strategies that we can utilize in teaching technologies education. Some of these specifically for digital technologies, but many of them will encompass both. Now, the first is worked examples, where you work through with students an example of how to solve a problem. That might be how to make a cake, or it may be how to um, create a loop structure in coding. Um, 
there can be a whole range of different elements of that. But essentially, you work with students and work it through like we would do with a maths problem or structuring an English essay. There's various ways of working through an example. Another technique is called use, modify, create, where the students use something. So they might um, say in computer programming, they might use a database, um, a little, say, a list of, of student names, and then they will modify it and they will change it. So maybe instead of being able to search just on the first name, they might change it so they can search on their last name. And then they will create something new from that. They might decide then to, instead of using it for a list of names, they might create an application where they can sort through and find a list of movies and find information about their favorite movie and create a little database for that. So it's going through a use, modify, create process. So they use the, the technology first, then they learn how to modify the technology, and then they learn how to create something new with that technology. Another approach is called speak aloud. And this is where students articulate their thoughts as they try to solve problems. So let's say they're trying to um, write a program to move a picture from one side of the screen to the other side of the screen. By speaking aloud and articulating what they're trying to do, it often helps them in understanding what's happening and they're able to solve the problem more easily. Now, this leads into some other techniques, such as rubber ducking, where instead of just speaking aloud, they traditionally it's using a rubber duck and they explain what they're doing to the rubber duck. It could be any object. Um, it could be uh, their pencil case. Um, but it's the process of articulating their thoughts that helps them with the problem solving process. And this is actually used by professional computer programmers. Um, it's a problem solving strategy that helps them. Another technique is called code tracing, where students look at their programming and they go through line by line and see what happens or what should happen and whether or not it does happen. And they can find out where in that series of instructions things may be going wrong and follow through and identify what's occurring through code tracing. A more complex process of that is called the PRIM uh, process where they try to predict what should happen. Then they run their program. They then investigate why it hasn't done what it should have done. They modify it, and then they remake it and go through that process again. So again, it's a problem solving process, but it specifically uh, focuses on that prediction element where students think through what should happen, see if it did happen, and then try to work out why it didn't. Another technique is pair programming, where students work in pairs and generally use that speak aloud technique, but they explain what they're doing to each other. Now, one technique around pair programming is you have the pilot and the co-pilot. And the co-pilot gives the instructions and the pilot follows out the instructions. The pilot doesn't make up their own ideas. They don't um, do their own solutions. They have to follow the instructions of the co-pilot. Um, there's often a mix and match of that where they discuss things and so forth. But that's the basic concept of pair programming, where the co-pilot has to articulate what they want to have happen, and the pilot interprets that and codes it. And through that process, they both get a better understanding of what is involved. Another technique is called Parsons Problems. This is where you give a partially completed um, solution and the students have to either select from or come up with the elements that are needed to complete the solution. Then we have peer instruction where you have a student that has mastered something teach another student or group of students how to do that. And we have also alternate conceptions. This is where we look at different ways of understanding different concepts and presenting those concepts and then students then learning that there are different ways of actually um, interpreting what they're learning and trying to then collaboratively decide upon what is the most correct way. 
So there's a whole range of different aspects around that. Uh, a couple of other techniques, semantic waves um, is a reasonably complex approach looking at abstract and um, concrete concepts and how we identify meaning um, in what's being learnt. So I'll let you read through that. And then finally, we have concept maps where we try to articulate understanding of how different concepts relate to one another. And we map those out on a diagram and draw lines between them to show how different ideas relate to other ideas in terms of what students are learning. So there's a whole range of different techniques and strategies that you could incorporate into your lesson planning as you think about the teaching of technologies um, subjects and in particular the use of direct instruction as a pedagogy. And so these can support direct instruction by allowing students to have a more active engagement in the processes involved.